And we're going to uh, read now from God's Word uh, a passage from the Old Testament, or one verse, actually, from the Old Testament, and then a passage from the New Testament. We're continuing our series in the Ten Commandments. A few years ago, a survey was carried out in America uh, asking Americans how many of the Ten Commandments they could name. Uh, it was actually found that more people could name all the ingredients of a Big Mac than could name all Ten Commandments. I guess that would probably be the same over here as well. But I think out of the Ten Commandments, there is probably one that people would not only remember they would say, well, I've not broken that one. And it's the commandment that we find in verse 13 of Exodus 20. Commandment number six. You shall not murder. Uh, one of the shortest commandments, one of the easiest to remember, and surely one of the easiest to keep. Well, if, if we think that, then we might be shocked about what Jesus has to say about this commandment. So we're going to read now from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 26. This is Jesus preaching uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He's just said that I am the fulfillment of the law. I've not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. In verse 21, Matthew 5, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. These are Jesus' words to us. This is God's word to us. And what Jesus says here in this passage is very unsettling. He is effectively putting murder and anger into the same bracket. He says both of them are subject to God's judgment. And it's unsettling because while none of us might think of ourselves as murderers, all of us get angry. We may not know what it's like to murder somebody, but I'm sure all of us know what it's like to get angry with somebody. You see, what Jesus is doing here, he's getting to the heart of, of the commandment. What does it really mean to murder? You know, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they had reduced murder, just as they reduced many of the other commandments, to a, just an outward offence. But Jesus is going much deeper than that. He says it starts with the heart. But before we get into what Jesus says, we, we first have to ask the question, what authority does Jesus have to tell us what the sixth commandment really means. How can Jesus say, you know, I tell you, I am defining what this commandment is all about. How does Jesus have the authority to do that? Well, imagine it like this. Uh, you're walking along a footpath or you're driving along a road and, and there are way markers, there are signposts telling you which way to go. The trouble is, over time, these signposts have gradually been changed uh, somebody, uh, maybe a little bit mischievously, has gone along and, and they've changed the direction of these signposts. So they're no longer pointing in the way that they should be. 
So how do you know the way you're supposed to go? How do you know the right way? What if somebody came along who claimed to know the right way? And they changed all the signposts so they were facing in the right direction, in the, the original direction where they should have been pointing in the first place. Now, you might be suspicious of such a person. You might say to that person, well, what authority do you have to change those signposts and, and to say that this is the way that, that they should go, the, the way that they should point? You would want something from them, wouldn't you, to, to say that, yeah, I, I have the authority to do that. But what if that person was the creator of the footpath or, or the maker of the road? The one who put those signs in place right back at the beginning. Surely he would be the only person you could trust to say which way the signs were really pointing. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He is saying, you think you know the way that this, this marker is, is going, the way that this signpost is directing you when we come to the sixth commandment. But I'm telling you, this is what it really means. I am the fulfillment of the law, Jesus says. I'm telling you the direction the law is pointing you and the way it is to be followed. And if Jesus is who he claims to be, if he is the son of God, if he is the fulfillment of the law, then we need to listen to what he says about anger. And the first thing that we need to listen to is his warning about the judgment for anger. Beware the terrible judgment for anger. And in verses 21 to 22, Jesus mentions four offences and four judgments. He begins with murder. You shall not murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And the judgment, if we went back to Exodus and the chapter after the, the Ten Commandments, chapter 21, we find the judgment for murder in the Old Testament is death. It was the death penalty. And the, the, the religious leaders and the Pharisees of, of Jesus' day would, would acknowledge that. But Jesus then goes further. He says anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And the judgment that he's referring to there in verse 22 is probably the civil court. And again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, that's an Aramaic insult. You imbecile, you, you fool, you blockhead. It's answerable to the court, and that court is probably the Sanhedrin, the, the religious court. And then anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Four offences, and Jesus is showing us that those four offences are all on the same level because they all result in judgment. And all of those offences have at their, their root a contempt for another human being. It is showing that you think that their life is less valuable than yours. That they don't deserve the same dignity and respect that, that you deserve. That is exactly the same thought process that a murderer must go through before killing somebody. And Jesus says, just because you haven't gone ahead and pulled the trigger or wielded the knife doesn't mean that you're not as guilty. Because the same root that, that ends with, with murder, it's, it's found in those other offenses of anger, of contempt and, and hatred and bitterness towards another human being. And it all results in the same judgment. Uh, all those places that Jesus mentions in, in verse 22, they're all places of God's judgment. And did you notice where the judgment finishes? With the fire of hell. L literally, uh, it, it's the Gehenna of fire. And Gehenna was, a, was an actual place. Uh, there was a, a, a valley just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, it was the, the local tip. In Jerusalem, they didn't have what we have in, here in Newark, a, a, a kind of a waste recycling center. They didn't have things like that back then. 
They took their rubbish to this valley outside of the city. They dumped it there, uh, and they set the rubbish on fire. And that fire kept going all the time. There was this smoldering fire. If you went down into that valley, it probably would have stunk, but what you'd also have, have been struck by was, was the fire, the smoke. And Jesus says that is the judgment for those who commit this offence of anger. And it's a reality that remains for us today. The reality of eternal judgment, the fire of hell. If we refuse to listen to Jesus' warning about anger, if we are unrepentant in our sin, in our sin against other people, then the judgment that we have to face are the fires of hell. Now, there's another danger as well, I think, uh, when it comes to anger. It's, it's one of those sins that we can hide under the surface. It is a sin that, that perhaps can be easily denied. Maybe it's a sin that only rears itself now and again in your life. And maybe we think that anger isn't really a big deal for us. So it might be for somebody else, but, but not for me. Uh, a, a pastor uh, called Paul Tripp, he wrote a, a book on the dangers of pastoral ministry. He called it Dangerous Calling. And he begins the book with this sentence. He says... I was a very angry man. The problem was, I didn't know I was an angry man. I thought that no one had a more accurate view of me than I did, and I simply didn't see myself as angry. You know, we, we can be blind, can't we, to, to what's really going on underneath, to the anger that might be bubbling below. That anger that might burst out, boil over when somebody does something to you that, that just sends you over the edge. You know, an extra demand that is placed on you. An injustice that you just weren't expecting and it kind of hits you out of nowhere and suddenly it, it all boils out. But the rest of the time, well, you're a calm, rational, level-headed person. You haven't got an issue with anger. We shouldn't be fooled by our respectable outward persona. You might look around this morning and think, well, none of us are angry people. You might look at me. Well, surely he's not an angry person. But God knows our hearts, doesn't he? God knows what goes on inside. He sees the murderous thoughts, the motives that lurk beneath the nice veneer. And we always have to be asking ourselves, don't we? Is there a disconnect between our inner private life and what others see of us on the outside? Not just with this sin of anger, but, but other sins as well. Is there a difference in the way we act at home, perhaps, in private, the way that we act in public, at church, at work, in our communities? Can we be gracious with another church member Charming with a client, uh, pleasant with, with, with one of our neighbours. But when we're in, at home, maybe when, when we're with our nearest and dearest, we can be irritable, we can be rotten, we can be grumpy. You know, grumpiness is not godliness. Grumpiness is just anger on a low heat. It's simmering away. But when the heat rises, it can boil over into full-blown anger. And yet grumpiness, it feels a long way from murder, doesn't it? You know, just getting irritable and angry now and again feels a long way from actually taking somebody's life. I, I think in our own culture, 
grumpiness is almost like a, a virtue in, a, in an ironic kind of English sense of humour sort of way. There was a TV programme um, a few years ago, Grumpy Old Men. And uh, these more mature celebrities um, kind of had, did pieces to camera about all that was wrong with the world. And there was a follow-up to it called Grumpy Old Women to show there's not just men who get grumpy. But we have to be aware of this, don't we? We have to be aware of what's going on under the surface. I have to be aware of that. Um, Last year, my family bought me a mug. And you might be able to see what it says underneath. It says, Mr. Grumpy. (laughs) And on the other side, it says, this is my happy face. But we have to remember, don't we? We might laugh, we might laugh about it. Our, our culture might sell mugs and t-shirts out of it. But grumpiness is not godliness. It's anger on a low heat, simmering under the surface. Jesus says, murder is in the same ballpark as anger. And the judgment for those who are angry and unrepentant about their anger, ultimately leads us to the fire of hell. At three o'clock today, millions of people are going to hear a loud alarm on their phone. It's an alarm that they won't won't have set themselves. It, It might go off on your own phone. It's called an emergency alert. It's a new UK government service to warn if there is a life-threatening emergency nearby, it's a test. There won't be an emergency this afternoon at 3 o'clock. But, you know, right now, we have a life-threatening emergency. We have a, a warning that we need to heed from Jesus about anger, about the state of our hearts. And if we're going to deal with anger, we need to first understand the root of anger before we get to the fruit. So what is the root of anger? Uh, The the Apostle James, the the brother of Jesus, he he helps us to think about this in in his letter in chapter 3 and 4. He tells us that we need to examine our hearts. Uh, Verse 14 of James 3, if we harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition, pride in our hearts, it will come out in the form of anger. He says our fights and our quarrels with others come from desires that battle within us. We need to start with the heart. And there might be other possible sources of anger as well. There might be anxiety. Perhaps an anxiety that that comes from maybe a lack of trust in God. For for myself, I think the times when I'm most anxious are often the times when I'm most likely to get angry. Because when we're anxious, we're on edge, aren't we? The slightest thing might trigger a reaction. Our anxiety within can erupt in anger on the outside. And other people can get hurt. Or discouragement. Discouragement can leave us feeling raw, weak. It can leave us, again, on edge. And maybe feeling resentment. Maybe feeling bitter. Perhaps uh, we're angry at the injustice that we're experiencing. And there's broken relationships. Particularly when it's what somebody else has done to us. And you can end up bitter and frustrated, maybe defensive. Or perhaps the emotional pain of a broken relationship is so great that pain 
uh, has to find an outlet. And sometimes the outlet of our emotional pain is anger. And now, there might be other roots of our anger. And, and for each one of us, we, we need to examine our own hearts. What is happening? What, what, what are the desires that are battling within us? And ask the Holy Spirit to help us. But it's helpful to look at the heart first and then to look at the fruit of anger. Uh, and James makes clear what anger results in. It results in disorder and disunity. There's a damaging effect on our relationships. There's fights. There's quarrels. And it's interesting that, that James, uh, James chapter 4, verse 2, having talked about fights and quarrels among you that come from the desires that battle within you, he then says, you desire but do not have, so you kill. See, James ends up in the same place that Jesus ends up. From the desires within us to those expressions of anger, the fruit of anger, the quarrels, the fights, which ultimately lead to murder. Jesus says God's judgment for anger is terrible. But Jesus took that judgment on himself, on the cross. On the cross, Jesus experienced hell. He experienced the eternal fire of God's judgment in those three hours of darkness. He became sin for us. We were once enemies of God. We were once bitter and angry against him. But through Jesus, God has reconciled us to himself. He's taken away our sins. He's taken away the judgment against our sin. And now we have peace. We now have reconciliation through our Lord Jesus Christ and through his cross. And so if we are God's children who have been given peace, we will want to pursue peace with others. And that's the next part of Jesus' teaching, to pursue. Not the ugly um, anger that boils up within us, but, but to pursue the beautiful path of peace. You know, it's not enough just to avoid anger. Jesus says we must also pursue peace and reconciliation. Uh, in, in the New City Catechism, uh, which is a, based on a, an older catechism, a series of questions and answers, it says in question 11, what does God require in the sixth commandment? And the answer is that we do not hurt or hate or be hostile to our neighbor, but... Here's the positive part, to be patient, to be peaceful, to pursue even our enemies with love. So it's not enough just to avoid hate and hostility and bitterness and envy. We must also pursue peace and love. And Jesus gives us two examples of pursuing peace in Matthew 5. Verse 23 to 24, he's talking about worship. If you're going to offer your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there, go and be reconciled first, then offer your gift. The next example is in the context of the law court. If you're on your way to court, reconcile on the way before you get there. Don't leave it until you're at the court because of the consequences. Now, this teaching of Jesus is countercultural. And it's countercultural because in both examples, Jesus is urging us to look at things from somebody else's point of view. Notice Jesus doesn't say, if you feel anger towards your brother, then go and be reconciled. But Jesus says, if your brother or your sister has something against you, Go and be reconciled. It's not about what you 
uh, have done or, or, or what you feel, what you feel somebody has done against you. It's what you have done against somebody else. We live in a very self-centered society, don't we? What I feel, what I think, what I believe is the most important thing and you know, uh, uh, others have to fit in with that. But Jesus says not to remember how others have wronged us, which, which is so easy to do, isn't it? But remember what you might have done to somebody else. To realize the impact our anger might have on our relationships. To step into the, the shoes of our brothers and sisters and, and, and to think about how, how the way that we act might impact on them. The problem with anger is it's self-glorifying, like, like all sin. It's all about me. It puts me at the center. It makes me the most important person in the world. And if somebody has wronged me, well, I have every right to be angry. They're the ones who need to apologize to me. But Jesus puts it the other way around. He says, if there is something that you need to apologize about to somebody else, that's what you need to remember. Because Jesus' kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. It's a kingdom uh, not of self-assertion and self-glorifying, but self-denial, self-humbling. It's putting others first and ourselves last. And that's why Jesus says, if anyone remembers that his brother or sister has something against him, leave your offering to God at the altar. The, the, the principle is, you can't separate your vertical relationship with God from your horizontal relationship with other people. If you're out of fellowship with a brother or sister, you're out of fellowship with God. We are a body. We are a family. If we're children of God, if we've been reconciled with him through our Lord Jesus Christ then we need to pursue peace. Now, the, the, the Bible does leave room for righteous anger. There might be things that happen in our world and in our lives that we, we can be righteously angry about. It says in Ephesians 4, in your anger do not sin. I think the problem for us is that often in our anger we do sin. But I think on, on the whole, wherever possible, we want to be pursuing peace with people. Not holding grudges, but pursuing peace. Now listen to what James says. James 3, verse 17 to 18. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And Jesus says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And can you see the contrast between an angry person and a peacemaker? I mean, what, what, what kind of person do you want to be? Somebody who holds on to grudges? Somebody who, who is following the wisdom of the world, where I have to stand on my rights, I have to defend myself, or to be a peacemaker? That the wisdom from above, that seeks to be full of mercy, full of good fruit, full of righteousness. But while we, we want to pursue peace, we also need to be realistic that we live in a broken world. We have to be realistic that not all relationships will be restored in this life. And we believe that restoration will happen one day. In the new creation, all things will be reconciled uh, under Christ. 
we will know true and perfect peace then with him. But in this world, though we might pursue peace, sometimes that peace, that reconciliation might elude us. So just finally, very briefly, I want to just give two qualifications uh, on, on pursuing peace. And these come from the context of, of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5 and, and the wider teaching of Scripture. Now, firstly, we're only responsible for what others hold against us when it's a result of real sin or error on our part. And where I'm getting that from is what Jesus says in Matthew 5 and verse 11. He says there, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. So what Jesus is saying here is if we want to live righteously, if we want to live lives that obey Jesus with him as our king and be faithful to him, sometimes there might be people who are against us simply because we're seeking to be obedient to Jesus and follow him. There might be people who will persecute us, who will say all kinds of evil against us. There might not be uh, peace between us and that other person because we are following Jesus. But providing you're acting in love towards that person, if they've got something against you, then it is their responsibility, not yours. And secondly, we're responsible to pursue reconciliation, to pursue peace, but we're not responsible for making it happen. We don't have that power to change somebody else's heart. All we can do, if, if we've wronged somebody, and we... we accept that and we we confess that. We try to reconcile that relationship. But sometimes we have to live with the pain. That relationship may never fully heal. Paul says in Romans 12, verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. So you do your part, you pursue peace, you confess your sins if you've sinned against somebody, if you've done wrong to somebody. But we have to leave the rest to God. You know, there there were enemies that Jesus had that were never reconciled to him. He even prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But he was never reconciled to them. So pursue peace, pursue reconciliation. It's an urgent need. But leave the outcome to God. And, and then finally, if, if, we, if we've been convicted this morning of, of where our hearts are, particularly in regard to this commandment. If we've examined our hearts and we don't like the look of of what's there underneath, then we need to go back to the start of Jesus' sermon. Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin. You see, to, to have our sins exposed and, and to mourn over our sin and to be broken by our sin is a blessing. It is not a blessing to hide our sins away and to sweep them under the carpet and to say, that's not really an issue for me. No, it is a blessing to, to see our sin in all its ugliness, to see where our sin will lead us to judgment, but then to bring our sins to the foot of the cross. And to experience God's forgiveness for our sin. To see that Jesus died and took the punishment for our sin. And and as we close our service, we're going to end at the foot of the cross. We're going to sing a song called Beneath 
the cross of Jesus. Because the Christian life isn't for those who are perfect. The Christian life isn't for those who have never got angry and never said anything wrong against somebody else or, or thought wrong thoughts against somebody else. The Christian life is for those who have messed up but who have confessed their sin and taken their sin to Jesus. We come to the cross just as we are, with all our sin, with all of our anger, and our unworthy soul is one. And then verse 2 of this song tells us how we are changed. We're no longer chasing our own selfish dreams. We're made one with each other through grace alone. And then the final verse tells us how we should now live as followers of Christ. We walk in his footsteps. The one who had every right to be angry with others because of the way that he was treated, and yet he prayed, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. Beneath the cross of Jesus, we will gladly live our lives, lives freed from anger and marked by a pursuit of peace. So let's just reflect for a short moment and let's then sing.